If you're like some of my friends that think Chipotle's main contribution to the food economy was introducing E. coli into their burritos or making Mexican food more white, you should really listen up. Chipotle's been an innovator in creating cleaner, healthier, fast casual food way before the current vogue for less processed foods became an economic driver in the marketplace. This is Cornucopia. Today on One on One, we're going to be talking with Chipotle's Chris Arnold. Of course, we'll look at E. coli, but there's another more important story. That's their role as an innovator in creating cleaner, less processed, fast casual foods. A model that until they added Nyman Ranch pork to their carnitas, most analysts and experts said was impossible. Chris, welcome to Cornucopia. Thanks for having me. Tell us about that decision to include Nyman pork in your burritos yeah i I actually think that uh the the decision to start serving pork from nyman ranch is is one of the the real kind of milestone moments in chipotle's history um we we opened our first restaurant in 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 denver in in 1993 and and we had the, the carnitas uh, which are pork on on the menu from the beginning, uh, but they they didn't sell very well, and and Steve wasn't super happy with them. Steve uh, Steve Ells, uh, our our founder and and chairman, who's who's also a classically trained chef and and so very uh, very much aware of the details that that make for really good uh, food. And Steve was working on. Uh, uh, a new recipe for the carnitas, uh, thinking, yeah, we can probably sell more of these if, if we make them, uh, if we make them better. And, and while he was doing that, he, he read an article in a little, uh, newsletter, uh, that, that, uh, some of your audience may be familiar with, um, Ed Bear's, uh, newsletter, The Art of Eating. And, and it was an article about the farms of Nyman Ranch that were raising pigs in more traditional ways on, uh, open pastures or in, in deeply bedded barns and without the use of antibiotics or, or added hormones. And he really liked the story. And that prompted him to, to order some pork from Nyman and cook with it. And, and he loved it. Uh, the, the flavor was amazing. The texture, really all of the eating qualities uh, were really uh, spectacular. And uh, Steve continued his exploration uh, going out to Iowa and visiting some of the Nyman Ranch uh, farmers and and then he went and visited uh, some of the the hog producers that had been providing our pork and uh, what he saw at Nyman was kind of the idyllic image of American agriculture. Uh, you know, pigs on pastures and rolling Iowa hills and red barns in the distance. Um, but that's not really the reality of most American agriculture. And, uh, and, and, and as part of his, his, uh, explorations of pork at the time, he went to, to visit, uh, some of the commodity producers that had been providing our pork and he was really horrified by what he saw. Pigs that spend their whole lives indoors in really densely crowded conditions, uh, conditions that necessitate the copious use of antibiotics to keep the animals from getting sick. And Steve very quickly came to this decision that he didn't want for his success or Chipotle's success to be uh, connected to this model that he saw as being really exploitative. So we started serving pork from Nyman in all of our restaurants. This was in 1999, and we had about 50 restaurants at that time. And, and this really was a decision that flew very much in the face of conventional fast food wisdom, which tells that if you, you need to keep costs moving in one direction, which is down. And if we started serving this Nyman pork and we had to charge more for it, if, if we thought carnitas weren't selling well before, well, you know, now you're going to drive the sales down even more. And, and what we saw is very much the opposite. Uh, when we started serving the pork from Nyman, it costs more. And, and that meant we had to raise the price of carnitas. They went from, uh, at that time being about 450, uh, for a carnitas burrito or, or order 
of tacos to five fifty, from being the least expensive thing on our menu to the most expensive thing on our menu. And and, and uh, what we saw was uh, that we started selling twice as many carnitas as we did before. And and part of that is. Um, when we made the price change, when we made the decision and incurred the, the price change, we accompanied that with a lot of communications in our restaurants. We made these uh, posters, for example, that had beautiful uh, black and white portraits of, of some of the farmers that were producing the Nyman Ranch pork. And, and they said things like, we know exactly where our pork comes from. Dwayne, and it would have a little story about Dwayne Dorenkamp, who was one of the Nyman uh, farmers. He's, he's retired now, but but uh, was a, a longtime Nyman uh, hog farmer. And and what we found is that people were trying the carnitas who hadn't necessarily had them before, in part because of the story, because of the support for family farms, and because of the better animal husbandry, uh, and kept buying them because they were just so much better than they were before. Um, and there was a really, really important lesson uh, that we learned from from that transition, and that was that people, even in a kind of fast food environment, a fast casual environment, people are going to be willing to pay a little bit more for food that they recognize is a little bit better. All right, we're back with another reminder. Rate us on iTunes or wherever you listen. Sign up for our email list at cornucopia.show. And we need your stories, folks. We're launching a new segment in January called Grocery Hell. Inspired by my own true life nightmares as a wholesale grocery rep with a mediocre distributor. We want to hear from you, soccer moms, truck drivers, store managers, cashiers, sales reps, regional managers. Send us your nightmares to contact at cornucopia.show. Put grocery hell in the subject line, and we'll get back to you whether or not we feel your story really was grocery hell, or you just need to toughen up, drink some more coffee, and stop being so emo. So let's talk about Hodo Soy. You did a similar move in creating a vegan and vegetarian menu edition. Yeah. Um, so our restaurants have always been popular uh, with with vegans and, and vegetarians, and uh, you, you know, any kind of um, uh, dietary restrictions or preferences that, that make it a little more difficult for them to eat in sort of a typical fast food or fast casual restaurant, because you don't come in our restaurant and you know, order a number one and uh, you know, get this sort of pre-packaged uh, meal. You, you pick and choose everything that goes into your uh, own individual order and it makes it really easy for people to accommodate these uh, different dietary restrictions or preferences and and Steve was really interested in uh, the idea of a new vegetarian or vegan uh, offering and uh, thought that something from tofu might might be a really good alternative uh, and that's when he met Min Tsai and Min is the the founder of Hodo Soy and uh, um, Min, Min moved to the United States from the Vietnam and and remembers as a child uh, the tofu that he would eat there with his family. If you talk to men, uh, uh, he'll talk to you about the tofu that that he was encountering uh, most often uh, when he came to the United States that he really didn't like uh, as much as he did uh, back home in Vietnam. He, he kind of described it as you know typically having kind of a chalky flavor and a kind of less uh, appealing uh, texture. And so Min uh, started Hodo Soy uh, to make tofu in, in really the, the sort of artisan, traditional ways. Uh, and and uh, Steve really liked that story. Uh, he liked the, the uh, artisan nature of what Min and, and the team at Hodo Soy uh, were doing. Uh, he liked the story. He liked the attention to ingredient quality. You know, they're, they're working all with uh, or organic um, uh, soybeans. And and so we uh, we started uh, a relationship with with Hodo uh, to make uh, we we call our our uh, tofu offering uh, we call sofritas and uh, the way that is made is uh, with. Uh, patties of uh, Hodo soy tofu uh, that we sear um, and then cook it with a sofrito, which is sort of the uh, uh, Mexican or Latin American uh, uh, 
combination of herbs and, and spices, chilies and onions and, and things like that. I, I'm imagining there might be some pushback from the financial team in terms of developing this product and using probably the most expensive tofu you could buy and on the supply side. If this thing takes off, we might have a little replay of some of the challenges we had with Nyman that I believe you guys had maybe two yeah. or three years ago. So on the on the ingredient cost and on the supply side, where does that factor into the it, equation? You know, it, it isn't as uh, predominant a part of the conversation here as you might think. Um, it, culturally, uh, you, you know, as a chef-founded and chef-run company, we've always had this really uh, uh, acute focus on ingredient quality and efforts to wring a few, you know, cents out of the the, the price of an entree. Uh, aren't necessarily uh, as, as predominant conversations here as they might be in, in other restaurant companies. That was something we learned in the, the, the move to Nyman Ranch pork and some of the other ingredient uh, changes we've made over the years um, that, you know, first of all, people are willing to pay a little bit more for, for something that they, they recognize uh, is a little bit better. So we've always been able to balance things uh, on the cost side in a way that, that the company continues to operate profitably. Uh, we, we have, as a percentage of revenue, uh, the highest food cost uh, or among the highest food cost uh, in the restaurant industry, regardless of category, not not just sort of in the fast food or fast casual universe, but but among uh, among restaurant companies, we have uh, the highest or among the highest uh, uh, food costs in the industry. Um, but we there are efficiencies elsewhere in our model that that let us invest in in food and and still uh, run the business profitably. Um, the supply side is is perhaps a bigger part of the equation in some ways here um, because there's always been a, a risk that uh, we may not be able to to get as much of something as we need when when we're buying these uh, better you know premium quality ingredients you're often playing in um, sort of a smaller segment of the overall supply system in the United States. With uh, Min and 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 Hodo Soy, uh, we were fortunate that um, you know as well as as Sofritas do for us. Um, it's still a relatively small percentage of our overall product mix, um, and that allowed uh, Hodo to to really scale up uh, production in a way that didn't unnecessarily strain their business. We haven't seen any disruptions um, since moving to, to Hodo. You, you did reference an issue we had with port, and we did have a, a span of uh, several months uh, where we couldn't get enough pork that met our standard for all of our restaurants. So for, for the span of several months, uh, we had about a third of our restaurants not serving carnitas, and when we had this supply issue, when we couldn't get enough pork that met our standards, it was more important to us to take a stand uh, in favor of the protocols and the animal welfare standards and not have all the pork that we needed for a period of time uh, than, than it was to compromise our standards uh, so we could uh, continue to offer it everywhere. And, and we ultimately uh, found a solution to, to that challenge. But uh, the commitment is sufficiently deeply held that uh, you know, we're really not willing to to, to compromise our standards uh, in the face of your kind of short-term supply challenge. Just a quick break before we get back to our interview. Rate us on iTunes or wherever you listen. Subscribe to our email list at cornucopia.show. And if you're enjoying this interview, be sure to check out Episode 6, a discussion with Michael Moss, author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Salt, Sugar, Fat, Back to our interview with Chris Arnold. And I want to talk a little bit about that real trashing you guys took in regards to the food ingredient challenges you have. You know, to my mind, if you look at the overall health impact of McDonald's, Burger King, 
fast food restaurants in a country where 40% of Americans are clinically obese, where we have a diabetes epidemic, at the risk of sounding a bit like um, like um, kissing Chipotle's ass cheeks. <laughs> it seemed like, I'm kind of like, wait a second, yeah, this was a problem, but maybe because I knew more of the background to what ingredients you were choosing to serve, I'm wondering why there was this huge outcry when the large food companies are basically poisoning a substantial portion of America. And I know this is a subject that's past news, but I'm wondering in terms of the attention to your problems versus longer-term health effects from the traditional high-fat, high-salt, very processed, extremely... Um, well, I'll leave it at that. That's, uh, Matt, I think a super interesting question. Um, and, and I don't know that I have a really good answer for it. Um, you know, the, the, the problems, the, the food safety issues that, that we dealt with that, that you're referring to kind of at the end of, uh, 2015, uh, you know, look, I mean, in, in our business, uh, that's about as bad as it gets, right? I mean, that's not, uh, something that, uh, you ever want to deal with as a restaurant company or a packaged food uh, company or, or a food retailer, uh, you, you don't want to deal with that. Um, the reality is uh, sometimes you have to. I mean, these, these risks exist uh, mm-hmm. in the system. And I think the fundamental difference is the real cost of cheap food. And, and that's, I think, really what you're getting at is the impacts to human health, the impacts to the environment, uh, the impacts to animal welfare uh, when you're trying to produce as much food as you possibly can for as little money as you can. And unfortunately, I think, I think we've created a system, a food system in this country where that has become so much the norm that while it is the topic of kind of some ongoing discussion uh, or debate, it's become uh, such a common common set of practices uh, that people aren't uh, necessarily alarmed by those practices the way they should be. And I think a lot of people, a lot of consumers uh, don't necessarily understand the underlying issues in really uh, large-scale food production that contribute to all of that. What we dealt with uh, was a, a, a set of anomalous challenges, which uh, I, I think contributed to the amount of, of conversation uh, around them. And, and fortunately, those are more anomalous circumstances and, and not um, uh, as everyday occurrence as uh, as the, the, the sort of epidemic of really cheap, heavily uh, processed food. So what we dealt with is, is something we, we certainly hope to not deal with again. We, we put a lot of uh, new uh, policies and practices in place on the, on the heels of that and, and, and committed at the time uh, to, to really making Chipotle an industry leader in, in food safety and have worked very, very hard uh, over the last year and a half or two years uh, to, 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 to do that. Maintaining quality in the very fast-moving environment, the problem with the challenges of growth, is that with some of the food safety challenges from when you guys analyze that? You know, I don't, I don't know that I would say that, that, that growth played a hand in that. There are thousands of, of restaurants all over the country that have you know, the same or very similar food safety practices in place today that, that we had in place two years ago. And, and what we saw with, with the challenges we dealt with is a, 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 a contaminant, a pathogen, in that case E. coli, uh, came into our system them somewhere in through our our supply chain and and while we believed that we had the right protocols and and practices in place um what we saw in retrospect is that uh, we could do better and and that we needed to do better typically what happens in a food service operation that has a food safety challenge is the operators will go to work specifically on that challenge. So if you're a restaurant company and lettuce caused a salmonella outbreak, you'll go to work on your lettuce supply and make sure that uh, you have best-in-class food safety and handling practices in place for your lettuce. 
and you kind of go on running everything else, uh, perhaps the way you, you, you had, had been doing it before. In our case, um, no cause was, was ever identified uh, for, for the E. coli outbreak in, in 2015. So that really forced us to take a holistic look at our supply chain, at every ingredient that we use, the flow of every ingredient that we use from uh, the farm to our restaurants, putting in place best-of-class food safety uh, protocols for every ingredient that we use. So if there was a silver lining uh, to what we dealt with, uh, that may be it, where it really forced us to take a look at uh, the, the food safe, safety system very uh, holistically, very systemically, um, instead of just saying, oh, we have a problem in this area, and, and so we fixed that. Uh, we had to take a look at the whole thing and, and make sure that uh, we, were, we were buttoned up really across the board. Adwala had a similar challenge. In this case, it was with apples. At that time, they were selling unpasteurized juices. This was before the acquisition by Coca-Cola. And not to minimize what happens, Adwala changed its practice where everything was pasteurized, thereby, to some critics, satisfying liability lawyers, extending the shelf life on their product, and making it less fresh and minimizing the nutritional value. In terms of any of your practices, did anything change from on-site, on-location prep versus centralized prep that then gets shipped, thawed, and prepared in a different um, way out of the outbreak? Really, almost everything changed, or at least new uh, practices were put in place for, for every ingredient or nearly every ingredient. Uh, unlike a case like Adwala, where, where it was kind of one fix, as I understand it, applied to everything, pasteurizing uh, a juice. How we went about it really, uh, you know, again, was... was driven by each individual ingredient. Um, we use a lot of fresh produce in, in our restaurants, for example, onions and jalapenos and bell peppers um, and, and uh, avocados for guacamole. So things like that, for example, now uh, come into our restaurant as, as whole fresh produce. But before any prep work is done on you know, avocados and onions and peppers, for example, they're blanched. So submerged into to rolling, boiling water. Uh, for a brief period of time, which which provides a pathogenic kill step. It creates a, a dramatic uh, reduction in, in the possibility of any uh, pathogens being on that raw produce before uh, it's prepped. Um, and then we also changed just some little uh, things in terms of like order of operation with how we make things like salsa or produce where uh, uh, diced onions and jalapenos and cilantro uh, will macerate uh, for a short period of time in the citrus juice that uh, that we use in our salsa and guacamole, which also has a, a pathogen reduction. So, so we did some things like that with with produce. Uh, we we did some things with uh, meats, for example. Uh, our our steak uh, now comes to our restaurants having been sous vide, um, so it's. Uh, cooked, vacuum sealed and, and cooked in a, a water bath um, uh, to a perfect medium rare temperature so we're not uh, handling raw steak in our restaurant. It, it comes in having been sous vide and it's, it's marinated and, and grilled and uh, uh, to the extent that created any change in the, the flavor or eating quality of the steak, uh, we actually think it was an improvement. Now we have this steak that's more uh, consistently uh, uh, cooked to a really nice um, uh, medium, uh, uh, medium, medium rare uh, temperature, uh, not creating uh, the, the kind of cross-contamination risks that you would have with, with raw steak in the restaurant. So there wasn't for us a single fix like, like you would have in a case uh, with Adwala where, where pasteurizing juice was the, the answer to that. For us, there was sort of a different answer for each of the ingredients that we use. A lot of other fast food and fast casual operations will minimize any of the prep work, bringing the steak in pre-cooked, frozen, where it just needs to be thawed on the grill or the sous vide on that 
to develop that process on a large scale yeah. it must be quite fascinating. It, it's it's really fascinating, and of course, this is a really you know, sort of fine dining, kind of fussy cooking technique. And and the beautiful thing about a cooking a steak, for example, sous vide, is is it's you know, vacuum sealed and put into this uh, water bath, and there are calculations about times and temperatures and everything. But if you're cooking uh, you know a piece of of steak to uh, you know a, to 140 degrees. Degrees, your temperature, you really can't overcook it, and and so it now comes in uh, unlike typical fast food, which is as you noted, like you know, cooked and frozen and then cooked again, and uh, that that's not happening in our restaurants. Um, just a note: we got Fleet Week here in San Francisco, so there may be some of the boom from the Blue Angels doing their rehearsal uh, evident. Um, so so let's finish up and and. Tell me about your your new. It's going to be within the existing franchise extension into hamburgers, or this is going to be a new a new restaurant. It's a it's a new restaurant. Uh, it's called Tasty Made, and and we have we have only one of them right now. It's in Lancaster, Ohio, uh, and the idea there is um, uh, you know pretty different than than Chipotle, which is. You really heralded as one of the pioneers of this, you know, fast casual uh, segment of the restaurant industry. Uh, Tasty Made is sort of more like fast food of old, and and the idea there uh, was, you know, Steve thought that there was really a lot of benefit in that kind of original fast food burger model, where all you did was burgers, fries, and shakes, and, and not like what. Unlike what In N Out Burger, uh, for example, does today, um, where you could execute those things. Now there are the Blue Angels uh, right on. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so you, but when you were doing only those few things, you could execute them really, really well. And and what's happened over the years with with kind of traditional with fast food burger places is um, they've added chicken and fish and salads and hot dogs and ice cream and frozen custard and and. And, and all of these things uh, to a point where you really can't do any of them in the restaurant anymore. It's all made off-site, and, and, and none of it's all that good anymore. And uh, so with Tasty Made, Steve kind of wanted to, to go back to that original kind of fast food burger model and, um, and see what that might look like and how that might work for us. And uh, it, you know, it turns out that, that the, the timing of it, when, when we opened the, the first Tasty Made about a year ago, um, was perhaps not ideal. I mean, we, we were still kind of uh, dealing with some of the aftermath of the, the food safety issues that, that we've discussed um, and, and really uh, needed to keep our focus squarely on Chipotle. And so Tasty Made kind of uh, got put on the back burner for a while. It was uh, when we opened it, it had been far enough along in, in development that it didn't make sense to us to, to put the brakes on it. Uh, so we, we, we uh, forged ahead and, and got the restaurant open, but uh, then you know, maybe haven't paid as much attention to it as, as we should have. We've just taken on a, a partner who, who I think you may know and, and or know of, and, and, and many of your listeners uh, will as well, that, and that's uh, Chef Richard Blaze, who uh, people may remember mm-hmm. from the, the reality cooking show Top Chef, and uh, Richard is a, a exceptionally capable uh, chef and, and restaurateur, uh, you know, and, and just as a person, as nice a guy as you'd ever meet. And uh, so, so Richard has come on board now and, and is a, a partner with us in Tasty Made, and, and he's kind of taking a look at uh, the food and the menu and some tweaks we might make here and there uh, to, to turn that up a little bit from, from where it is now. And, and uh, we're eager to see uh, what sort of stamp Richard puts on it and then uh, uh, start making plans for where that might go next. Any uh, last comments before we sign well, off? Well, I, I, I said that I tend to geek out on these things when uh, when we were talking before the interview. So it, uh, it's a it's a real pleasure because normally when I'm see director of communications, I'm thinking it's going to be a lot of PR spin with, without a lot of knowledge. So I was curious when I sent you those rather detailed questions. 
at not understanding your background and your long-term tenure with the company if you were going to be doing a little homework talking to people in the know as opposed to the fact that obviously as I mentioned to you before we started I tend to be geeky as well so it's been a been a pleasure uh, going down that uh, geeky uh, conversation highway. I, it's, I, I find these conversations always really enjoyable when, when you're talking to people who, who understand uh, the, the issues and, and care about them. And, uh, uh, yeah, that's really been the basis of our business. So um, it, it was a lot of fun. Thanks again to Chris Arnold. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. This is Cornucopia.